Um, is the positive terms thing a big deal? Do you have to check that? Yeah. Why? This is what my students say. Why do you always make us check that crap? It's a series, yes. So I'm talking about the sequences being a, a relationship via, you know, inequality work. But what if these guys were allowed to be negative? That won't be possible because it's one goes to infinity. Exactly, because that could easily happen, right? You could allow decreasing forever, and certainly negative crap would be greater than anything that B sub n was positive-wise. And so you would have a problem, right? Concluding converging because it could decrease to negative infinity, uh, which if you added up that would, you know, not necessarily converge. Uh, so positive is actually something you have to check. It's a quickie check, though, typically. When you're talking about these are, you know, on a quiz or an exam that you guys are getting graded on, you just say really fast, oh, look, numerator is a, a constant, and the denominator is positive uh, as long as n is greater than 2, so boom, positive, done. And then you move on with the test, right? Uh, okay, so the other case, by the way, is uh, if the smaller guy is divergent, then the larger guy is, uh, of course, divergent as well because it's even bigger. Uh, and I don't think the positive there is as big of a problem, right? Okay, so let's take a look at one of these guys. Here's a typical example for this lecture. And um, how do you, if you were, you know, to explain this to somebody, how would you proceed? Uh, maybe one of the fourth over into the seventh. Yeah, kind of, kind of do the hand wavy argument, <laughs> right? You're like, oh, it's kind of like, um, and, and again, that's not necessarily valid, right? You just go, oh, it's, it's the same as one over n cubed, and so convergent done, right? Can you say that? No, 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 no. <laughs> you have some work to do. Um, so with this guy, uh, it does feel kind of like one over n cubed, though. So what would we expect this should occur? Probably convergent, right? That's kind of like your initial gut reaction. Uh, but we have to check two things now. That we've, now that we've discussed that, or maybe that all happened in your head, you didn't actually write anything down yet. Um, what is the two things you got to check? It's all positive. We said that's a big deal, right? Because we don't want stuff going down to negative infinity, uh, which for this guy, can you argue that without too much fanciness, right? Starts at uh, 1, so top is positive and the bo bottom is positive, so the whole thing's positive. Uh, and the thing we're going to compare it to is 1 over n cubed, equally positive. Uh, but then what's the, so that's the first hypothesis that you're supposed to check, which again, a lot of students forget that part, right? You're like, I'm not checking that. I'm going right to the inequalities, because that's the hard stuff. Uh, and if you don't say that, you did ding, you lose a point or two, at least if you're in my class, you do, because uh, it's a requirement. Uh, but then how do you show that inequality work there? What do we want to show? We want to show... We want to show which one is ours, this guy right here, right? That's ours. And we want to talk about this guy, which we said we know from previous work that that is convergent, right? So what is it we'd like to be here? Yeah, we'd like less than, right? Because we know that if, uh, if this guy's convergent and this one that is ours is smaller than that one, uh, then this would make ours be convergent by comparison, right? <laughs> so assuming we've checked the positive discussion, uh, the next thing I see my students do is they go, oh, I want that to be truth. I said, write it down, hand it to you. They turn it in and say, look, that's true. Is that, I mean, there's a question mark there for a reason, right? You have to prove that this is true. So how do you go about proving that that is true? True, both of the functions use the um, first derivative test. Okay, that might help in terms of whether it's increasing or decreasing. Um, Sure, if the difference was less than zero, that would mean that this guy, assuming you subtract it this yeah. way, that would imply that as well. Um, but I think we're beating ourselves up, aren't we? You can divide everything in the left term by one of the fourths, so you get another Ooh, one. Ca careful now, if you start dividing on both sides of something, you're assuming it's already true. But it's, you're, 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 one over n to the third, over one Whoa. over n to the third, it's just one, you just multiply by one. Yeah, you know you could sub out the n to the fourth for a one if you just state that it's going to be greater Right, so um, I think, then I think it, this, is, this is how I would proceed, and this is the stuff I show my students that, you know, I don't think this is completely pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Uh, I mean, this is typically a Calc 2 discussion, so the mathematical, you know, practice has been there for a while. And I'm very confident that my entire course could write that down without arguing. Yes. Right? <laughs> you don't need any massive proof of this statement. It's not like you need, you know, hardcore trigonometry or something to write that down. It's like, um, n starting at 1, so true. Right? And then what do you do to that to make it look like the inequality we seek? Because this is a true statement now, so we can mess with it, right? Yes. Flip it. Change the direction of the inequality. 
Last but certainly not least, multiply both sides by n to the fourth, which is certainly positive, correct? And not changing the direction of the inequality. Not that it would matter even if it was odd because we're starting at one, so this is all positive stuff anyway. And of course, whoa, what do we end up with? What we wanted. Right? So all that discussion was fine, the difference being less than zero, all, all of that is totally valid, but this is a five second quickie, right? So your inequality work becomes uh, a big deal here. If you can do these little steps, uh, then it makes an example like this really hit home because you can then say for sure now they're all positive. Uh, my series is, or the sequence is less than one over n cubed, which we know is convergent, therefore I'm convergent also, right? Um, so that's a good warm up one. That's like the first comparison idea because the inequality is not terrible. And then, you know, I come along and make you do something like that. <laughs> Why would he do that? I hate you so much. Chuck, just, I mean, when you increase the denominator, it will just automatically become less, right? Right, and that's kind of the... Uh, sort of the hand wave? That, that, well, it's not hand wavy at all. You, you just would write that down. You would say, I'm going to start with this, um, you know, n to the fourth over n to the seventh, which is one over n cubed. And you say, I'm going to make the denominator get bigger, which makes the fraction smaller, and that's also a valid argument for proving the inequality. And you would take that? Yeah, I'd take that. You just... yeah. You'd have to write up a sentence or two. Whereas the inequalities, you don't have to write much. You just do this, and then you flip it, and then you multiply, and you're done. So three lines without any full you know, sentence justification. Because as you know, everybody knows, you don't want to write words in math. Right? <laughs> heaven, forbid, heaven forbid you write me a sentence that says, make the denominator bigger, the fraction gets smaller. Heaven forbid you have to write that down. <laughs> Um, so let's take a look at this guy, and well, give me some suggestions. What does it feel like? <laughs> That's a terrible math word. <laughs> n squared over n cubed. Kind of like n squared over n cubed, right? Kind of. Secant squared n will. There's a limit to how big it gets. Secant squared? I don't think there is, is it? Secant is 1 over cosine. And so secant's going to have asymptotic behavior. If cosine never hits 0, it blows up. So if okay. we get close to that asymptote, I don't think this has a, a, a max on it. Okay. Um, but what did you guys say it looked like again? It felt like what? This is n squared, and somebody said that feels like n cubed, <laughs> so it feels like 1 over n. Right. So the fact that it doesn't have an upper bound may be good. Because right. if we think... It feels like 1 over n. Don't we want ours to be even bigger than that? Yeah. So the fact that this may blow up could help. <laughs> They're like, yes, this could be a good thing. Um, so now we have to go, assuming we have played with it, and when I say that, I mean mentally played with it. We haven't actually written much down yet. We've just thought that it feels like 1 over n. Uh, we would then have to show two things are true, right? What are the two things that we have to check? Positive. 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 And, and then... Well, we don't need anything about increasing, decreasing. We need ours to be bigger than 1 over n. So we need some inequality work. We need those two things. The positive, can we say we did that? Perhaps all positive? OK. Um, so I want to show now, again, I'll write it down as, as a question, because I don't know if it's true yet. I want to show that this guy is bigger than 1 over n. That's what I'd like to show. Because if I can get to this, well, then I'm, this guy's divergent, and mine's bigger. So divergent, I'm done. But the inequality works a little trickier than before. So again, we still have all that stuff on the table from before, right? The whole call it a function, the subtractive, look at the difference. Um, but let's start with something maybe a little more. Yes, sir? Does the squeeze theorem apply to squared term? The Careful, this is not a limit. Oh, OK. okay. So squeeze theorem applies for limits. And unfortunately, this is just inequalities, okay. right? I'm just trying to show that some expression is bigger than another expression. Um, so the pitfalls you can get into here is thinking squeeze theorem might work because you're not actually doing a limit at all. Uh, you can start with this, thinking it might be true, and then manipulate the hell out of it, which is also illegal. And, I mean, technically you can cheat when you get to the bottom work the steps backwards, but starting this and manipulating it is a problem because it's not valid yet. I mean, we can, it's the absurd way to assume that something is right and go from it. Well, that's the kicker, is if, 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 if you started manipulating this and you got down to a true statement like, you know, n is greater than 5 or something like that, which it, it is, 
you could then work all those steps backwards and say, ta-da, I'm, I'm good. But technically speaking, from a logical math standpoint, starting with this and doing stuff to both sides is, is illegal, because you don't know if it's true. And the only rules that we have, addition on both sides, multiplication, are only true if you're given a true statement to begin with. <coughs> right? That's the, that's the little blue box in, in a math D course that says, if this is true, then you can do all this crap. So we don't know if this is true. Can you say I'm decreasing the denominator, that makes the fraction bigger? That's true, but then what about the numerator? So by a, a minus one here, yeah. that would make this, it is a similar argument he said a minute ago, the denominator is smaller now, right? If assuming this, I call this the square root of n to the sixth, um, then you subtract one, you've made the denominator smaller, which makes the fraction bigger. So that part's true. The top of the In fact, why don't we write that down the clever way, right? Again, I don't think any of my students would argue with this statement. Right? Actually, I'll, I'll do it in two stages. Right? No, no one would argue that. No, no one has a problem writing that down at this level of math. Right? Like, oh, yeah, that's true, because that's the same thing, and you took some stuff away. Right? Um, so again, you can certainly square root both sides, and that statement is true. And then what? Flip it. So I get to this statement which is basically what we said is true by, you know, powers of observation saying, oh, um, that denominator is smaller than this one, so it's a bigger fraction, right? Same, same thing, but within, without having to write any of that down. I just did two lines of inequality work. But the problem is this is not my function, is it? No. Or not function, maybe I shouldn't use function. It's a sequence, that's not my sequence. It's still gonna hold though, if, even if you plugged your... So, it goes back so yeah, so you do another one. You start off over here, and, and you guys agree that that is going to be certainly larger than... Yeah. So here's how we could argue that. Does anybody have any problem with secant squared being greater than zero? Yeah, no, it's squared stuff, right? Yeah. I guess technically you can't even have equals here, right? So there's no potential for equality. It can be greater than one. Yeah, in fact, it's even greater than one. So if I added n squared to both sides, that's also certainly true, right? <laughs> Do you see it? Mm -hmm. I've just shown you that this fraction is greater than this one. And this thing, this numerator expression, is greater than this one. So what happens if I take the big guy and multiply it by the big guy, and the small guy and multiply it by the small guy? <laughs> right? So take two trip. larger things and make them multiply them, and take the two smaller things, and isn't that got to be still greater than? So. Again, notice one, two lines of inequality work, and then you multiply these two to get the result that you seek. Take this guy and this guy and multiply them. And this guy, the smaller one, together with this guy, and you get n squared over n cubed, which is one over n. Ta-da, done. Isn't that clever? So. This is why I use these examples, because uh, it avoids some of the nastiness that gets into these inequalities, right? When you're trying to prove one thing is larger than or smaller than something else. Um, questions so far? You guys happy with these? Wouldn't it be cleaner to multiply this by n squared? Say that one more time. So before you, so you go over to the side, wouldn't it be cleaner to multiply that by n squared on both sides so you don't say anything? I could as well, right? And then add something. So another logical argument would be to take this inequality, which you know is true because we started with that, multiply both sides by n squared, and then add something to the bigger fraction, which is greater than zero. So that'll also work just as well. Yes, ma'am? Which are you choosing to be equal Oh, great question. I, I, I didn't know when I started the problem, right? This was, I didn't even know I was going to use comparison tests, to be honest with you. So. Typically, when you give a series, what's the first thing I should have checked? Divergence. Test for divergence, right? Um, but if I were to take the time to do that limit, isn't the bottom bigger than the top? So if I were to write that down, which I wouldn't, because the conclusion would be it goes to zero, which means what for test for divergence? Okay. Another big misconception. <laughs> it means go do more work. Um, I didn't even know I was going to use comparison. But once I got to the comparison discussion, we did a little hand-wavy argument of what the degree on the top and the bottom was. And the top felt kind of like n squared, and the bottom felt kind of like n to the third, which means it's kind of like 1 over n. Kind of like. That's a really bad. <laughs> right? Because of that, uh, I decided now which of these is going to work. Is the first statement going to help me much if it's, if it's talking about 1 over n? 
No, I need something that's <laughs> divergent, which is one of So I'm trying to now show um, that this guy right here would be mine, which is larger than 1 over n. So mine is now b in, in that example. Does that work? OK. So this is usually, what, second or third day that you're discussing series. Uh, and uh, up until now, we've cleared up a couple of misconceptions, the biggest of which I think is the one with the p series, because I I've, I've forgot to you know, mention to the students that you have to check those conditions. Uh, but now I get to some of the theorems, which uh, is very clearly stated in almost every textbook I've come across. If you've got two convergent guys uh, and you add them together, then that result is convergent. Uh, and if you multiply a convergent series by a constant, it's still convergent. Uh, and, and the proofs of those usually are done with the definitions of convergent series, right? The, the epsilon n limit of the partial sums. Uh, so, again, I don't know how often you show that in class, but it doesn't seem to be too amazingly new, right? Uh, if you show this in class, most of the students are like, oh, I, I can see that. That makes sense, right? It's, uh, oh, this one adds up to L, this one adds up to M, so it should be L plus M, and everybody seems relatively comfortable with them without showing the proofs of these theorems. Uh, but what I have found for comparisons is actually more crucial uh, is this theorem, which is not always shown in class, and well, even in some textbooks. Briggs and Cochran. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, <laughs> actually, that's not true. I think uh, the second one is a homework problem in, in the new text, Briggs. Um, but um, does that seem reasonable? One of the series is convergent and one of them is divergent. So when you add them, you get divergent. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah. Maybe not as reasonable as the first one, but how could you argue this is true? Okay, all right. That, that, that's a, a good starting point. How could you prove that, though? You could, yeah, that, that's the problem is we don't know what the infinite is. You could just write the series all the way down to n, which is kind of like a dot, dot, dot notation. Okay, but that's now now you've made it, uh, if you said stop it at n, you've written down or a n finite plus amount. One, right? so. yeah. The actual the argument's actually quicker than you think, and this is why I take the time to show this one in class because we're going to use it repeatedly in comparisons. We're going to come across something like, and I'm just going to pick something. I use it on the next slide. Uh, one half times one over n as a series. What happens to that? One over n we know is divergent. You multiply it by a half. Does that matter? No, it's still going to be divergent, right? But I'm going to use that constantly in my comparisons because. Maybe the inequality work gets messy, and I've got an extra freaking two in there. I want to, you know, I'm like, damn it, I have to go do off a whole other integral test just to prove. And the answer is no. You just get to use things like this. Um, in fact, I'm going to show you the argument real quick. It's actually a proof by contradiction, which is it sounds all fancy for those of you who haven't had a, a proof theory course or discrete math or something. Um, we're actually going to assume the exact opposite is true. So let's assume that this series that I've given you, this c times b sub n, let's assume that that is convergent. Hoping, of course, to get a contradiction. Now, we're given what? The given is that b sub n is divergent. That's part of the hypothesis. So we're given that this guy right here is divergent. Agreed? That's given information. But this guy is convergent. I'm assuming that. So based on what we said in the previous theorem, which let's pretend like we proved that formally, um, I can multiply by any constant, right? And it's still convergent. So this is convergent. So I can multiply a convergent series by any constant. OK, let me be clear. Not any constant. I can't multiply by 0, right? Um, so what can I do to that? Can I multiply that? According to that first theorem, I can say now that the sum of some constant, I'm going to choose cleverly, 1 over c times c of bn, according to the first theorem, is also convergent, right? Look, what is that? And that my, that's my contradiction staring at me in two lines. I just said that 
that thing is convergent, or that's my assumption. I've multiplied it by a constant, which I've proved is already convergent. So a convergent times a constant makes convergent, which proves that Bn is convergent. Wait a minute. I just told you Bn was divergent. That's a contradiction. Therefore, my assumption is crap, and it must be that this series is divergent. See how quick that happened? By the way, you can do the exact same argument with this guy. Instead of multiplying, you subtract. <laughs> right? So. This actually is, in terms of what I have used in, in the past, a more powerful theorem. Even though you know, this is true, this actually helps you a lot more when you come to comparisons, right? when you want to do a divergent case. So not shockingly, <laughs> here's my example. And this is already an interesting one to use because uh, when you see it, doesn't everybody want to do the alternating series test? <laughs> you see that negative one to the end, you're like, oh alternating series test. You're just salivating to use it, um, which we'll get to that in a minute, which is kind of why I use this example. Um, is that an alternating series? Just plug in a couple of terms. Let's just say, you know, write it down. Well, um, I have to start it at 2, otherwise I get, you know, things blow up. Um, so what do we get when we write in, uh, when n is equal to 2? What's the first term? Two plus root two, right? Everything's positive. And the next one's going to be plus, because it's a sum. So one over, uh, now this is a three, but I have to do minus root three. Which one's bigger? <gasps> it's still positive. So the next one would be what? One over four plus root four, which is two. So that's, again, positive. And the next one's going to be one over five minus root five. Still positive. So it is not an alternating series. And so if you were to use, this is another thing students do. They see a negative 1 to the end. They go, ah, alternating series test. Boom. Limit goes to 0. Decreasing. Done. Um, so of course, that's not true. <laughs> but what could we say this kind of feels like? Kind of feels like a divergent thingy, right? 1 over n. But uh, on certain cases, uh, this guy right here, that could be a, a, a positive root n or a minus root n, right? Mm -hmm. So if I were to do the inequality work and I worked solely with 1 over n, would that come out well? Is that always true? Uh-uh, it ain't. So trying to show that inequality work with 1 over n directly, which is kind of what it feels like to us, ends up breaking. However, um, what we can do is something like this. Uh, again, I don't think any of my students would have a problem, or any of you folks would have a problem, arguing that this is certainly true. Right? Um, whoa. Sorry about that. And so to, to argue that if n is even, the square root of n is always less than n, right? For any n? Or For any n, this is true. Well, OK, we can't radical negative stuff, so greater than or equal to 0 ends, which we're starting off at 2, so we're legit. Um, but if this is negative, then it's, it's, it's straightforward, right? If n starts at negative, then this is a negative thing, that's a positive thing, so we're done. Uh, and now, guess what I'm going to do? I want to make it look like that, mind you. I'm trying for that comparison idea. So I'm going to add n to both sides. n plus negative 1 to the n, root n. And I add n to this, I get. 2n. And then guess what I'm going to do next? Flip it. Which, of course, I'm going to ever so cleverly rewrite as that, which I can now use that theorem. I don't have to do any other work. Chuck said in class that if you have a divergent series and you multiply it by a constant, it's still a divergent series. And we proved it, homework number 75. Um, <laughs> so we can say we're done, right? We've just shown that our func our sequence is larger than something that is a constant times divergent, so is divergent. So we're done, right? What do we know about this? <coughs> Got to be divergent, yes? It's larger than something is divergent. It must be divergent by comparison. We did kind of gloss over one thing, though, didn't I? What's the conditions, again, for a comparison? Positive and inequality work. The inequality work, good. Uh, can we argue positive pretty quick? No. So say we did it. We wrote that down for Chuck. <coughs> hey, look, I looked at them. They're positive. Next step. Uh, but you have to at least write me that note that says I checked it just in case, because otherwise it's not a valid test, right? 
So this is a bigger font for a reason. <laughs> Remember that. Because I'm going to go to something down the road where I'm going to pull that back out of my pocket again. Just keep that example in mind. In fact, maybe I'll write it down off to the side just to, in case, you know, so I don't have to go back to the slides. It's 1 over n plus negative 1 to the n root n, right? <laughs> And we've proved that that is divergent. So I'm just going to write that down on the board and leave it there for a second. OK, but let's now move on. So questions about that? Um, what happens if the inequality work doesn't go well at all? So no matter of cleverness uh, gets you what you need. What do you tend to use next? So ratio OK, ratio might, but uh, with polynomial nature stuff, rational expression stuff, um, the ratio test almost always ends up inconclusive you end up with a limit of one, which means go do more freaking work. So when it's a ratio of uh, polynomials, right, or rational looking stuff, uh, it tends to be inconclusive. So yes, that is on board, that is an option, but it tends to end up being inconclusive, which just pisses me off and wastes time. As a student, I'm like, damn it, I just wasted five minutes. And of course, you know, you only got seven per question, so you're like, I got two minutes to pick another test. Uh, I, I tend to go, if I thought comparison was a good idea, uh, the limit comparison test tends to avoid the problems of the inequality work. Tends to. Not all the time. So this is what I tell my students. I say, hey, if you're doing a comparison or you thought comparison was a good idea, and you go off to the side to try and prove you know, one is less than or greater than something else, and it's just pissing you off, it's not coming out, try this guy instead. And what it says is very simply this. Take the ratio of uh, an an and a bn. Again, you've got to check positive. Uh, and do the limit on that. And if that limit is a positive constant, so it can't be 0 or infinity, but any other number in between there will be just as good, uh, then the two series do the same thing. And what that means is they're either both convergent or they're both divergent. Right? Is everybody OK with that test? Excellent. So my classic example for this one, assuming I get to it the same day I cover comparisons, is this guy. And James, the denominator thing. What does that feel like to everybody? One over, n. One over n cubed. But what the hell do we do with the denominator? So if you subtract in the denominator, it makes it bigger. So what is bigger than 1 over n cubed? That's larger than convergent. That help? No. Yeah, because you know if it adds up to 5, maybe I'm uh, bigger than 5, which is 7 or 10 or infinity. So unfortunately. The inequality work here will not be true, right? Is this smaller than 1 over n cubed? The answer is no, it ain't. But it feels like it should be. <laughs> but the inequalities go bad. You just you, All day long, you're trying to prove, you're trying to prove, you're trying to prove. In fact, I, I've even you know, taken the time to write this down in my answer keys and said to people, look, if, if this is what I expected you all to do. And, and unfortunately, you get to a bad place. Uh, here's what most students would write down, right? They're like, oh, yeah, that's true. Got that. Chuck showed us this trick in class. <laughs> and then you flip it. And then you multiply by n to the fourth. And you go, damn it. I'm bigger than convergent, which is useless, right? Um, so this is an, an example where the, the limit comparison test comes out really well. It's still a ratio, right? It's a ratio of these polynomials. So if you were to apply the ratio test to this, guess what you're going to get? Inconclusive. That's right. That limit will come out to be 1 with the ratio test. So this is a good candidate for a limit comparison test as an example. Uh, moreover, it's the same as the one we did with comparison five seconds ago with a plusy right there. So it makes for a good idea for students to see on the same day. You're like, ha, 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 this worked. Ha, 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 this didn't. Right? So is everybody okay with that? By the way, the limit comes out to be, I think, for this one, what? You want to write it down? I'll, I'll write the fraction down. It's going to be this guy, n to the fourth over n to the seventh minus one, right? And the other one that I'm going to divide by is because it kind of felt like one over n cubed, we said, right? So invert and multiply. And now you're doing a limit on this as n goes to infinity. So what's it going to end up? One, which is a positive constant. Therefore, they both do the same thing, right? OK. So I like to do that as an example. Um, but in reality, this whole discussion, this whole talk was actually originally created 
uh, based on the alternating series test. All of the ones that we've done so far, the, the erroneous statement I made about the integral test at the beginning and all these other things uh, were true and of course needed to be fixed as I, as I continue to teach second semester calculus. But in reality, this is the guy that started this whole thing. It's the alternating series test. Um, and so here's, here's how this test goes, just as again, quick refresher. You've gotta have an alternating series, which means every other term must switch signs. You can't have two or three of them positive and then a negative thrown in there once in a while, or uh, you know, negative, negative, plus, negative, plus, negative, plus, that's negative, negative. It's gotta be alternating every other term. That's a requirement. Uh, and then the two things that you can say are required to get convergent is, well, the limit of the terms that, that are positive have to go to zero, so ignore the plus E minus E game, and it's gotta be decreasing. That's the two conditions. And I just wanna emphasize one more thing is, there is no way this shows divergence. In here, what are the conditions to show something diverges? The answer is, there aren't any. So think of the test for divergence, go back to the beginning of this talk, test for divergence. Can you use that to show something converges? No. Oh, hell no. <laughs> the best you can do is say the limit doesn't go to zero, so it's divergent. If the limit goes to zero, you go do something else, right? So if these conditions are not met, guess what you do? Something else that does not mean it diverges. That's the first misconception. Half of my class will do the limit uh, or that, and they'll say, uh, let's say the limit went to one, um, and, they, and they get divergent by the alternating series test kills me, because it's not that test. In fact, it's the test for divergence, right? Because the limit didn't go to zero. Uh, but you can't say that it's divergent by the alternating series test because it's not allowed. It only says converge. But, you know, again, and, and this, this is then re-emphasized by every homework problem in every calculus book I have ever picked up, minus the ones Cliff gave me. Uh, <laughs> Everyone that we've used, or I've used as an instructor, the homework <coughs> problems are either convergent, which means both are true, or they're divergent, and the freaking limit goes to something else besides zero. Which just re-emphasizes all my students' misconception that they, oh, you just do the limit and you're done. In fact, I've actually seen people write it down like in books. Legitimate like authors with millions of dollars and selling hundreds of thousands of textbooks, and they write, we just check the limit, it's, it's divergent or it's convergent. I'm like, oh, it'll kill you. You have to check both of those, right? This is not a maybe situation. So this is where my students always say the following uh, typical example. Um, do this one, get it out of the way first. So uh, if I look at the positive part, the a sub n, um, does everybody agree that limit goes to zero pretty fast? So it's immediately convergent, right? I just did the limit, it went to zero. Must be convergent. No, because what else is required? Decreasing. And all my students go, well, if it goes to zero, doesn't it have to be decreasing? How many are thinking that right now? I was. Yeah, good. I'm glad you were, because when I was in your seat, I sure as hell was. I'm like, it goes to zero. How could it not be decreasing? And it can bounce. Most students don't think of that. You can head towards zero, but as you head to zero, you go up and then down, and up and then down, and up and then down. You go up and down so small you can't see it anymore, but you're no longer decreasing. So you actually have to check the following. We have to prove a sub n plus 1 is less than or equal to a sub n. We have to prove that statement is true. And again, this is where what things come in really handy. The function idea, right? <coughs> Take a derivative, show that it's negative, decreasing, blah, 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 blah. But again, most of the common ones, that's unnecessary, because isn't this certainly true? Yeah. Again, because of I told you so? <laughs> yeah. Because I'm a Math 31 student, and this is Calc 2, and I can write that down without proving anything fancy. And then guess what you do? Done. A sub n plus 1 is less than a sub n decreasing. Agreed? And then, of course, put the limit work together and you get that it converges. Happy? All right. So that's a typical example, which follows suit with all the homework problems. What uh, about the less than or equal to? Is that a big deal? <coughs> um, not a huge deal, but it is, in fact, something we should mention. If you are less than something, you are certainly less than or equal to something. The equality allows for a couple of repeats. So if you had, uh, you know, one, and then a half, and then a third, and then a third, and then a third, and then a fourth, and then a fifth, and then that is um, still decreasing, but uh, not monotonically, I think is the word they use, right? You allow for some equality in there. 
Um, and that's what we have here. Is this, this is certainly true, and so is that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, so not a fun example, but it does lead to the following problem is um, all of my students don't want to check both conditions. They want to just do the limit and say, I'm done. Must be decreasing. Um, so my examples for these guys are right here. These are the big ones. These are the, this took me a long time to figure these suckers out. <laughs> Because they're not obvious. These are not intuitive at all. They do make for good lecture examples and tutor examples when somebody has a misconception. If you have these in your pocket, meaning you've thought of them or written them down on the side and someone's confused, you can say, hey, look at this example, and it'll fix these misconceptions. So let's take a look at these guys. Um, what do we need? Um, alternating, officially, yes or no? What would, it, it, to make that true, this would have to be always positive crap, right? And is that always positive crap? As long as n is 2 or bigger. That's going to be the square root of 2 plus 1. And then the next one will be the square root of uh, 3 minus 1, which is still positive. So this is always positive crap. Same thing here, right? Always positive. So these are both officially alternating series. So what do we have to check? Limit goes to 0 and decreasing. If we check both of those, we're done. So let's do this one. Do the limits go to 0? Of the a sub n. So ignore that and look at that. Could you prove that goes to zero as n goes to infinity? In fact, uh, this would be a good squeeze theorem example. Whoever mentioned squeeze theorem, right? You could easily squeeze this between the plus e1 and the minus e1 and say, ah, they both go to zero. Bam. Our mind goes into zero in the middle. And this thing, same, same argument will work, yes? So do we agree they both go to zero? Yes. Step one done. So the next thing we have to check is. Are they decreasing? Well, before we did anything formally, what, what do you say we should write out some terms? I'll write out some terms on this guy. What's the first one look like? 2 is first, so that's 2 to the third, right? Because you do 2 plus 1. And then the next one is, um, well, it's a negative term, so what's the next one going to be? N is now 3. 3 minus 1? Uh oh. Damn it. What's the next one? Just for fun. We're not talking about 2, 3, so n is now 4. 4, that's positive, so plus 1. Do we have a problem? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we sure do. Yeah. <laughs> from there to there, it went from an 8th to a 4th. And then it went from a 4th to a 16th. God damn it. It's not decreasing, right? By the way, you can actually formally prove that it's not decreasing, but I'm going to get short on time, so I don't want to show you. Um, what about this guy over here? Is that one decreasing? Let's just write down a couple of terms. So the first one is uh, positive, right? And it's the square root of 2 plus 1, right? Guess what the next one is? It's negative. Square root of 3 minus 1. Ah, oh, damn it. We have the same problem, right? Again, you can formally prove that it's not decreasing, but why would you do that, right? This is a Calc 2 test. You're in the middle of the heat of battle on the day of the exam, and you've got seven minutes per question. Are you going to waste time proving it's not officially decreasing? No. What are you going to do? Go to something else, because the tests don't work. <coughs> but what I'd like to emphasize is we